This is KXSF 102.5 FM, streaming worldwide at www.kxsf.fm. And you're tuned in to Spark with Kelly Marlowe. Informing minds, inspiring ideas, igniting innovation. Let the conversation sink into your soul. This is Kelly Marlowe, host of Spark. Today I'm talking with Kevin White, an Emmy Award winning producer, director, and writer about his documentary film, Wilder Than Wild. Thank you for joining me on Spark today, Kevin. Sure, of course. Can you talk about your film, Wilder Than Wild, and what it is about? Sure. So Wilder Than Wild, Fire, Forest, in the Future, is really about, uh, it's a documentary that reveals as much as anything how fuel buildup, and 100 years of fire suppression added with climate change and a growing population in wildland urban areas has really contributed to these catastrophic wildfires that we're seeing, what some people call megafires. And that this vicious cycle about how wildfires are impacting our forests is actually contributing to more carbon in the atmosphere and not doing much to help the the climate. It's really a film, in a sense, that was my journey through this process. We started the film in 2014, and what initiated my interest in the film was the the Rim Fire. 250,000 acres burned in Yosemite and Stanislaus National Forest, but, and I have a family cabin that's very close to there, and what really was clear studying the, the rim fire was that this was a different kind of fire. This this was a huge so-called mega fire. It was very rapid, burned at very high intensity, which is different than most wildfires in the Sierra. The Sierra evolved with wildfire. So moderate, low intensity wildfire um, is, is part of the ecology of the Sierra Nevada forest. And for years, millennia, tribes that also lit lit fire there. They did they had a whole tradition of cultural burning. What happened in the, the rim fire was it was really clear that this is a different kind of fire and we really need to, to look at what's going on here. Wilder than Wild is really a journey from the rim fire through the so called wine country wildfires in twenty seventeen. Destroyed I think like nine thousand buildings and killed forty four people and then We have a little section now on the campfire in paradise. It's really a journey of me understanding how wildfire has impacted California and how it will do so in the future. What's interesting is that when we first made the film, we had a rough cut on October 7th, right on 2017, right before the wine country fires. And that was kind of our worst nightmare. We were really concerned about seeing that in an urban environment now. So we went up there, filmed up there, and kind of restructured the film a little bit to really incorporate what we know about wildland-urban interface. And that's a term that a lot of resource managers use to describe areas that are prone to wildfire. You know, they're wildland, but there's a lot of people living in them. You've been Um, following this for a while now, since 2014, you said? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So these mega fires are a new phenomenon and is appearing to now become a regular occurrence. And we have entire towns are burning down. Mm. And this new abnormal is becoming this new normal, right? Yeah. And I think people wanted to believe that the last huge incident last year was contributed to pg e So it's really a one-time situation, right? But it sounds like we're going to continue seeing this, which is what's happened this year as well. No question we're going to continue to see this. There are things we can do. We can do a better job of learning how to live with wildfire, to adapt to it, and to actually, there are several things we can do to address it. I want to say eight of the 10 largest fires in the last five years. I mean, this phenomena of a mega fire is just continuing and will continue. And what we've seen just in the last couple of months in California and in Oregon and Washington as well is an example of that. I think that there is a lot at stake. 
and I think that it's just going to continue to happen if we don't really wake up to what we need to do to address it. Um, typically, October is October is often the worst month for wildfires, but now I kind of call it the new abnormal in a sense because as, as our climate is warmer, drier in California, that that's contributing. To I've been in California for over 30 years. I don't think I've ever seen anything like this till recently. They may have been happening elsewhere, but it does feel like it's picking up. I mean, for it to happen consecutively like this, season to season, is so unusual. I've read that humans are contributing to 85% of these fires. What are you seeing? There's two kinds of contribution by, by people. The, the first is direct, which is things like sparks in the power lines that during windy events hit dry you know, fuels on the ground and then all of a sudden cause a fire. Fires can start from, from mufflers scraping against the, the concrete and, and sparking. I mean, you know, when it's really dry and windy out there, it doesn't take much. That's kind of a direct way that people are impacting it. But the, the indirect way is that where they're living, they're living in areas that are very wildfire prone. And they may or may not be really thinking about having a house or a home that is fire resistant. They may not have a lot of defensible space. So there's a lot of errors of emission that are contributing to. So there's a lot of these large mega fires. So as I um, understand it, it's because humans are expanding and encroaching out to more land that typically mm-hmm. is outside of urban centers. So as people keep going further out, right? Yeah. It's, the, they the, shouldn't the be there. Land. I guess my yeah. understanding is they technically shouldn't even be there. Yeah, I mean, it's complicated because the wildland urban interface, I mean, a couple of things. One, it's beautiful and people want to live there for obvious reasons. Another thing is often it's less expensive. So there is a lot of rural poverty, actually, and in some of these areas, rural working class areas for a lot of these areas. So I think the question is, how are we going to modify our policies to adapt to this? So that people shouldn't expand, like encroach further out? I'm not, I, I think it's a complicated question. I think what we need to do is if we're going to do that, then we should be absolutely clear about how we're going to live with wildfire in those areas and what we can do about it. Not going to make sense with just to put a house in the forest and say everything's going to be fine. Both from a policy point of view and from an individual landowner point of view, we're going to have to have um, some consensus on living with wildfire, you know, creating defensible space, and acknowledging the risk. I mean, right now, I can't get insurance for our family cabin in the Sierra. And most people can't get insurance, except for this California Fair Plan, which is prohibitively expensive and basically just covers fire and some other catastrophic events. And and that, I think, is also going to push people to think about, do I want to risk everything living in these areas? They may go without insurance. Yeah. So people are going to have to make decisions. We're going to have to figure out how we're going to Address. You can do all kinds of things about defensible space, and you can you can try to have a house that has a metal roof, and you could be being really careful with making sure there's not a lot of flashy fuel on the ground around your house and all that. But when you get these big fires, and they're so-called crown fires, a ball of fire comes from, starts spreading to the top, the crown of the trees, and just goes from tree to tree to tree. Just it incinerates, particularly with wind. It just the heat. The, the fuel and the wind combined to create infernos. I mean, these are really infernos, and you can't, it's hard to believe unless you experience it. But then when you see it, I tell you, you don't forget it because you, the power of a wildfire is just unbelievable. You know, it can just absorb forests and homes and everything in its path. I can and, only imagine. Uh, yeah. There are many people who don't believe that climate change is a factor in these wildfires. Now, the question then is climate change causing the wildfires or with the destruction of the immense number of acres that's happening right now contributing to climate change with the emissions of now more carbon in the air? I mean, acres of carbon right at this point. Or is ha- both happening? Yeah, it's difficult to say direct cause and effect. What is clear, just look at the facts. We've had a lot more mega fires in the last 
10 years. As, as California becomes warmer and drier, the temperature is clearly up. We've had years of drought, less snowpack, all of that. We have a warmer and drier California. It's very good science to say that's related to climate change patterns, warming world, frankly. The problem is when you have that, it exacerbates what is already a difficult situation, but started 100 years ago. When they started having wildfires, they wanted to keep all the trees. They, didn't, they looked at trees as a resource. They didn't want the trees to burn. They needed to provide lumber for a growing state, right? So they, they really had what they call the 10 a.m. policy. A hundred years ago, it was like if there was a fire, the first thing to do was to put it out. So when you have a hundred years of fire suppression in a state that evolved, with fire, you're going to have a lot of fuel. California had its own internal process where wildfire is natural. It would come in. It was often lit by lightning. It would come in during certain times of the year, burn out the, the fuels on the ground, mid to low intensity. There's some of it was high intensity, but usually not more than 5 or 10%. And this is called prescribed burning, right? Well, no. Well, actually, prescribed burning is what we do, actually. Prescribed burning means we prescribe fires. But because for years, for millennia in California, we had that naturally. So then when we, we suppressed it, 100 years of fire suppression, not just in California, throughout the West. You add to that a warmer, drier climate, and then you also add to that people living in areas that are prone to wildfire. Then you've got this kind of toxic, difficult mix exacerbating these fires and, and turning them into, if you will, really catastrophic mega fires. Your film does suggest that there needs to be prescribed burning, right? Right. Where you're clearing the grounds from building up and just, it's like small fires that then prevent bigger fires. Correct. And it's essential because in a sense, we're trying to emulate what nature used to do naturally and what the tribes did naturally for, for millennia. What we're trying to do is introduce fire on the landscape in a way that's healthy for the landscape. It burns it's all the flashy fuels on the bottom and it, the smaller trees, it gives the other trees room to breathe. The amount of trees per acre in the Sierra Nevada, for example, is way more than it used to be a hundred years ago. Part of this is we have a lot of trees per acre. Why are we doing well, more prescribed so, burning? So it's a really a couple things. One, prescribed burning, we absolutely need to do more prescribed burning. And I think there's consensus across the board and bipartisan support for this. And there's, there's recently they've been given some more funds to do this. But the reasons that it often doesn't happen at, say, landscape scale has a lot to do with smoke and air quality. So they can be preparing for a, a, a prescribed burn. And then they may or may not be able to add all of that, that smoke into the atmosphere because of the air quality issues, and particularly in California. Right now, we're living with a lot of smoke from all of these wildfires. And you can see that that's also toxic. So it's you're saying that it's not easy to do because it's going to affect air quality, and there's just it, other it, issues tied to it that they have to address at the same time. Exactly. Now, having said that, there are things that they can do, you know, plan for it but they will put a lot of time into the planning and then they'll do the fire. And we're, we're burning a lot more. We're, we're doing prescribed burns for a lot more acres now than we used to, but still it's you're not really kind of moving the needle, if you will, at landscape scale. We need to do a lot more. But it feels and, like with all this burning, it should just clear everything at this point. <laughs> yes, to a point. We've burned 2 million acres, I think, in the last month. That is just a crazy amount of acres for unplanned wildfires, right? And, you know, very catastrophic and has a lot to do with fuel. The quality of those fires, it, it's very, they burn very, very hot. And so what does that mean? It means that the, that heat of that fire just literally scorches everything in its path when it's high intensity. More importantly, scorch the, the soil. So the soil becomes hydrophobic. It doesn't accept water. And so then when you have, later on, when you have rains, it leads to floods. Fire regime used to have moderate and 
low intensity fire. We're not entirely prepared for these high intensity fires. Interesting. So, that, so even though we're burning, let's say we're, as you were pointing out, we burn 2 million acres, right? I would imagine that that would stop the wildfires, but it's not going to. Yes. I mean, of course, if there's no fuel, there won't be fires. We, fires need fuel. So if it's burned all the fuel in those areas, then it, it won't it won't burn. But what they have found is that it's that fires often burn in the same place they burned 20 or 30 years ago. It's really interesting. In the wine country fires, the Tubbs fire, there was a fire in 1963 that was exactly the same footprint as the Tubbs fire. Just superimpose them, and they look almost identical in terms of the area that they burned. The only difference is that during 2017, Santa Rosa had 200,000 people. Mm. There have been many fires in the Sierra that burn in the same place over time as they get more. Um, but the, 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 the problem is, you know, losing those big trees, those really big trees that hold lots of oxygen. They're like, the you know, trees are the lungs of the earth. Losing the big trees, that's really problematic. What goes in their place? Eventually, conifers will probably come back. In the meantime, you're going to get a lot of chaparral. You're going to get a lot of invasive species, and it's going to be really problematic. It may not burn really hot. That's not a healthy forest. We need fire to be to burn in our forest in a way that's healthy for the forest. That's part of the challenge. I completely agree with you. The question then is, why isn't the government doing more to address it? That's a big question, and you could argue it, it starts with why is the government doing more to address climate change? It starts there. There are so many things we need to do a better job of with respect to our environmental ecosystems throughout the country. The government, they just want to keep their head in the sand about the facts. The facts are really, really clear. There is such incredible evidence about this. This is no longer a question of belief. And so then you have to decide, well, do we want to listen to these facts and look at where this is taking us? And are we going to do something that the entire world can get behind to try to reduce our carbon footprint to mitigate the heat that we're going to have in our atmosphere that's going to change the climate? And, and right, just don't see the political will. That's kind of the top level thing. But on the regional level, there are very specific things we can do. And in our film, we have this group called the Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions. And what was so great about that is it was a bunch of community members from different parts of the community. There was a logger and an environmentalist and, and resource folks and everybody in between. And they all came together saying, look, we have to do something. They figured out ways to have an impact in terms of policy. And then they could go to the Forest Service and to different groups and then give them good ideas and build support for, for that through with the community. They could change policy bottom-up. It's like locals changing the policy and, and trying to work on their own backyard, trying to make their own backyard more fire resilient. It sounds like that's a more effective strategy than waiting for the government. I personally think that if we're waiting for Washington to do anything right now... Well, just the I, regional government, yeah. right? Like, I don't understand yeah, no, what the state of California is doing. Yeah. The thing about working local is so true. It's just so critical. The other part of this is I, I, I think it's really important to recognize where can we find leadership with this. And one of the most important areas to find leadership with is with our tribes. The Yurok tribe, we have a, an example of a cultural burn with the Yurok tribe. They've been burning, they've been doing cultural burns for literally centuries. So fascinating listening to them. A very different time then and a very different fire regime. But what's so interesting is I asked, well, did the fires get out of control or anything? No, they didn't. I go, well, how did she know when to burn? She goes, she just knew. She knew when the, the right time, the right moisture, she could just figure it out. She just knew when it was a good time to do it. There was a knowledge that had been passed on and that they lived with, in a way, with respect to wildfire in their area. We're less connected now to our environment and what's happening. Yeah, there's a lot to learn there. And I think there's, you know, there's a lot of other things we can do. I mean, the first and foremost is to, we have to start to rethink how we're going to do our planning. For a long time, we put a lot of effort into thinking about the fires that would start inside homes. 
And now we have to start thinking about, well, depending on where the, the homes are, we might need to start to think about what do we want to do to protect homes or make them more fire resilient on the outside. And how many people do we want to have in there? And what kinds of regulations do we want to have to protect each other? Because you could have everybody doing defensible space except the one neighbor, and they don't have defensible space, and then all of a sudden it gives a, a wildfire foothold, and that whole neighborhood can go up. really is pretty significant in terms of rethinking our relationship about living with fire. It also would require the state government to be more proactive in its strategy rather than reactive and waiting for one of these mega fires to happen. Well, that's true. I think state government is actually pretty, I mean, I think if you talk to them, they really know what they need to do. But I think that when you're fighting fires, two million acres right now, it it just becomes the nature of it becomes reactive. And and it's also difficult to have these firefighters who've been just dog tired after doing all that stuff. And then you say to them, okay, we've got next three days, we're going to do a prescribed burn, right? And where's the money for that? Because they've just been spending all kinds of money fighting 2 million acres of fire. It's a combination of of time and work and money. And and I think California does a better job than most, understands what's at stake. I don't know if we have the political will to really make the bigger changes that are going to be required if we're going to continue to have people living where they are, if we're not going to address a warmer, drier climate and what we need to do to respond to it. Well, I'm hoping as we head into this dry winter that we're not going to be seeing more mega fires. We don't know. I mean, one thing I will say, in the film we talk about the bark beetle, there was a, what was it, the Creek Fire down there in Fresno or just east of Fresno, and that, where they had to evacuate a bunch of people by helicopter. And we filmed down there, and all these shots in our film of, of, the, uh, of the dead trees, of the dead pine trees, as a result of bark beetle, you know, that was related to um, drought. When there wasn't enough water, the trees were susceptible to disease, the, the beetles got in there and they killed millions and millions of trees. Then, in the creek fire, as soon as I heard that fire was there, I said, oh, man, that's going to be bad. And within no time, it just took off. Wow. I mean, because, because guess what? There was a lot of dead trees. Yeah. And that's just like kindling for the fire. So we have to, great to do prescribed burns, but we have to start to think about ways to thin the fuels, in all kinds of ways. There's all kinds of tools that we can use at our disposal to do that. What's really clear is that what we're do- doing now by waiting for fires to just to come is not working. Where can we all see your film so we can learn more about what's going on and how to address it? The film is on PBS right now. And so there's lots of PBS. We've had something like 300, probably 350, I guess, broadcasts throughout the country, which I was really excited about because it, it gets seen as a Western issue. It's it's actually an issue for the entire country and the world. You see it on PBS. You can see it on demand on Vimeo, and it's going to be in Canopy, which is the platform that both schools and libraries use. If you just go to our website, wilderthanwildfilm.org, there's a lot of information there about ways to see the film. Well, thank you for sharing your journey in observing what's going on with these wildfires and your documentary film. Of course. Thank you. Great to talk with you.